we'll move to Dylan next. So great, Dylan, thank you for joining us. Um, so I'd like to welcome Dylan Levi King. Um, uh, Dylan's a writer, translator, and independent researcher with a focus on contemporary Chinese politics and its technical culture. Um, Miguel Marcos Martinez, one of our council members, spotted a Palladium magazine article that Dylan had written entitled The Genealogy of Chinese Cybernetics. And it was from that we, we reached out to Dylan to be our guest speaker today. Um, another recent publication was a piece on Lu Jinhuang, who is a thinker on the intersection of digital culture and urban planning. Um, Dylan's got an upcoming academic article on the theories that underpin Chinese cybernetics. So today's talk is the history of Chinese cybernetics and present applications. So um, Dylan, I will make you a co-host. Excellent. Present. Okay, that should be coming across now. Perfect. And let's just see if I can share my screen here. One moment. Uh, looks good. Looks good. And looks good. So just a... Uh, a thumbs up if you can all you can see that I'm sure perfect wonderful uh, first before everything uh, I really I'm really grateful for the invitation uh, to speak to you today and especially thank you to to Jonathan for for helping me out uh, ahead of ahead of coming to speak today um, yeah I've written about Chinese cybernetics but I, I feel I should share something about how my interest in that topic developed. Uh, my focus is on Chinese politics, Chinese politics and culture, first of all. Cybernetics was sort of um, a secondary thing for me. I don't come to it directly from a cybernetic perspective. But what I discovered looking at Chinese politics since the 1950s, especially in the 1980s, up until today, is that it's nearly impossible to understand the logic of Chinese politics the function of Chinese politics without understanding cybernetics and without understanding a somewhat distinct Chinese cybernetics tradition. Uh, as well, this cybernetics, the cybernetic thinking has spread throughout popular culture, the social sciences, and it's nearly impossible to get a grasp of those things without comprehending Chinese cybernetics. It's an interesting thing, one of the most um, honored poets of modern China is a is a gentleman named Haizi. Haizi is known for his sort of existentialist writing about you know uh, wandering down dark alleys at night and uh, contemplating streams and whatnot. But he he was actually a cyberneticist. He was an expert in in information theory and all of that stuff is deeply embedded in his poetry and without having a grasp of the chinese cybernetics tradition you cannot have any idea what what he's writing about so uh let's see if i can go on here so i i suspect everybody here is uh you know has a grounding in cybernetic history so i'm going to try to ground you in chinese history to an extent i've suggested four periods here uh, one beginning 1954 to 1966, talk, talking about rocket engineers and techno-utopians. This is when cybernetics for defense, as well as utopian central planning schemes developed. This uh, strong Marxist communist belief that's also there in, in Soviet cybernetics eventually, uh, in the idea that cybernetics can be a solution for planning the economy, planning politics, and as well, most of the expertise, as it is in other places, is focused in defense science, defense technology. That was true in China from 54 to 50, 66 too. And then comes a technical dark age. This is the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1978. You know, this, this calling the Cultural Revolution this entire period is a little bit problematic, but Basically, through this period, you had defense projects continuing. Everybody needs to keep working on ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. But politics intervened in the dream of the techno-utopians. There was the idea that politics, sorry, that science needed to be subservient to politics. And th at that time, the cybernetic thinking and cybernetic research is only focused on defense. Uh, 
Then we have this third period of the return of the cyberneticists. This is when defense co defense budgets are falling because you know everything is winding down with the Cold War. Um, it looks like there won't be any challenge from the Soviet Union or from the Americans, and they've caught up to a great extent with ballistic missile technology, nuclear technology. So all these defense scientists need to do something. And at the same time, the paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, says no more politics. We're going to put the cyberneticists, we're going to put the technicians, we're going to put the scientists in command. And then a fourth uh, period, which is what came after, which sort of describes the present conditions where you have a live high-tech surveillance and policing and economic management schemes which do connect back through those periods um so this gentleman here on the on the far left is is where we're going to begin i suspect he's somewhat familiar to to some of you that's mr chen shui sen he was he went to the united states in the late 1930s he went to MIT first, and then he ended up going to California to work with Theodor von Karman on various missile projects. So he was there at the birth of at the birth of cybernetics. He's the guy who ties in into the story of cybernetics that everybody is more familiar with. Uh, I'll, I'll move quickly through his life. Um, he ran into trouble in the United States, as you can imagine. He had a very high security clearance. He was sent to Germany to speak with Werner von Braun um, in 1945, but he was still smeared as a communist when he came back. So from 1951 to 55, he was under virtual house arrest. He was still leading classes and, and working, but he was cut off from the defense establishment. And it's in that period that he that he writes a very important book called Engineering Cybernetics. Excuse me. Um, which is a book not about the discipline of engineering cybernetics we have now, but a an attempt to stitch together multiple theories of of information theory and and engineering and cybernetics together. It's a, a book that was, I think somewhat definitely didn't have the popular appeal of, of some other works on cybernetics, but it was quickly translated into, into German uh, the year after it was published. It was pub translated into Russian in 1957 and, and in China, into Chinese in 1958. So through this period, he is working on this amazing book, teaching a, a couple classes, but he is deported once the Americans are convinced that all of his knowledge on on missile technology or, or aerospace technology has become obsolete. This, this was their calculation that anything he knew was, was useless. Of course, he was a great mind. If, if they had held on to him, uh, they would have had a great resource there that they would not have lost to, to China as they did in 1955. But when he goes back to China, he discovers basically an entire country that's run along the same sort of logic as the defense industry was in America. This idea that the, that the technicians are going to formulate these interdisciplinary cybernetic solutions to everything. Uh, there's, a, there's a quote by Heidegger uh, who says, uh, if, if, writing before 1949, saying, if, if China ever goes communist, then China will finally be free for technology. And that's what Tian Shui-sen discovered when he went back to China, this communist country that believed the scientists would, would lead them to the future. And he was feted as a hero. Uh, he was given free reign to pretty much design the 12-year plan that the Communist Party was working on for science in China. He's often credited with writing nuclear weapons into the plan, but they probably would have been there anyways. What he was able to do was write into that 12-year plan a number of things like ballistic missiles, uh, semiconductor technology, wireless control systems, automation, atomic energy. So even though he was a brilliant scientist and you know aerospace specialist, he was 
mostly in that period after he returned from 1955 to 66, let's say, a booster of cybernetic solutions. He had the ear of the top leadership and he saw that these cybernetic solutions, rather than just being able to be deployed in the defense industry, could be deployed over the entire country. You know, we, we, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with schemes to do the same in, in the Soviet Union or, or Chile, but um, there, there was, uh, there, there was a lot more enthusiasm and perhaps even more expertise early on in China. But of course, the difference in China in the 1950s was this, that they were at, at a much lower level of development. This picture of uh, Qian Shui Sen standing around various equipment is, uh, I believe, from from this from later in the 1960s. There there were computers arriving from the Soviet Union, and they were trying to reverse engineer some of their own, but they were at an extremely low level of technological development. Which takes us up to the period of the Great Leap Forward. You know, this is a period that's not that's associated in, in our minds and perhaps the minds of many people in China with, with massive starvation of, of ridiculous schemes like everybody bringing their pots out to a communal uh, oven to melt down. But for thinkers and scientists and technicians like Qian Shui Sen, this was a period where they thought that their technical solutions or cybernetic solutions could finally be carried out. As the Great Leap Forward began in 1958, uh, Qian wrote an article um, promoting his idea that all of society, all of the economy, all of industry had to be analyzed and controlled as a complex system. You see this, this diagram up here is with, with the sun at the left, solar energy is up at the top left and it runs through to on the right side, various things, not just food, but, but culture and clothing and down at the bottom to, you know, manure and pigs and leather and all these sorts of things. He promoted many schemes in, in this period um, that could come out of a cybernetic control of society and would be required for that, like artificial weather modification, um, complete planning of agricultural planting and harvest and fertilizer delivery, biomass fuel. Um, he even had a, uh, made a lot of progress getting people to do algae farming to, uh, against you know, uh, food shortages. But it, again, deep down, the key to these was a, was a cybernetic conception of the world. And at this time, he began popularizing what he called systems engineering, Xi Tong Gong Cheng. This is a, f a term I'll, I th will use interchangeably with cybernetics past this point, but it, uh, it was conceived of as a system that would subsume cybernetics it would include information theory it would include systems theory it's sort of comparable to to what we might call system cybernetics now the Xitong gong chong and the reason why he had such a disconnect between what was happening in the countryside where people were starving or people were uh on communes burning up all of their pots was because he was in the city he was seeing these computers finally arriving from the Soviet Union. He was seeing all these returnee scientists who were working on, on various projects. There was um, right in the middle of the call in, in the middle of the Great Leap Forward, there was a there was sort of a craze for operations research and um, um, linear programming where different OR experts were being sent down to factories and, and spinning mills to try to try to make processes uh, even more efficient. Um, you know, it sort of all ended in disaster as the Cultural Revolution exploded. So there is a, a lengthy gap there. But as 
1978 dawned, Mao Zedong was in the ground or in his glass jar. Uh, Deng Xiaoping finally emerged from the factional battles. And what he called for was for science to be subservient to politics. It's the idea that science and technology were sort of autonomous disciplines and scientists and technologists should be treated as autonomous from politics. Um, he turned again to the promise of cybernetics and the promise of what he called systems engineering. He worked uh, on an, to revise his book, Engineering Cybernetics, and then he took to state media promoting various, um, various schemes, various schemes for this systems engineering. This is a Wen Hui Bao, a newspaper, a state, state media newspaper. And the, uh, the headline at the left running vertically says, which means organizational technology uh, systems engineering. And in, in, in this editorial, he promoted systems engineering as a solution to everything. Going back to that culture, sorry, great leap forward image of where he had sketched out every element drawing from solar power. He imagined systems engineering as a system, as a, as a way of thinking or a method that could unite everything, that, could, that would be a way to avoid political dissent and would put the technicians in charge as Deng Xiaoping uh, desired. It was, a, it was a method to optimize the relationship between the elements within a system. And his, his timing was very good. His, his timing was always good. He got to California right before they, you know, the, the Second World War broke out. He got back to China just as they had stopped persecuting the returnee scientists. And he came out with this idea just as Deng Xiaoping had freed up everything and completely depoliticized science and technology. And as I said, at this time, military budgets were going down. So the cyberneticists had to look for something to do. And they turned to social problems, political problems. The seventh ministry, where uh, Chen Sui Sen worked with a gentleman called Song Jian, who was a Soviet trained cyberneticist, and a number of other Soviet trained cyberneticists, the Yu Jingyuan, Dai Ru Wei, the, a, a long list of names, they began to look for how they could get involved with solving social problems. And one of the most famous examples is the one child policy. So in 1978, I want to say 1978, they went to Song Jian, Chen Sui Sen, and a number of cyberneticists went to Helsinki for a, a conference on cybernetics. And it was there that they started to run into uh, people in the field who were very interested in the uses of cybernetics and mathematics to control population or to analyze population to figure out where population was going and how it could be controlled. Um, the one child policy in China is basically the result of this, this one trip to Helsinki, where the cyberneticists become very interested in the idea of using cybernetics to control population. And the missile scientists like Mr. Song Jian on the left here, he had the ear of the top leadership and pushed them to, to launch the one child policy based on his calculations, based on his, his promotion of a systematic understanding of the way demographics and population worked. Um, opinion differs on whether the, the one child policy was, was successful. Uh, the birth rate did come down, of course. It's, it's now they're struggling to get it back up again. But as a, as a cybernetic scheme, I, I think we could say that it, that it perhaps um, failed. Um, this was a case of having poor sensors and, and, and weak effectors um, as, they, as they controlled the system. They never had access to reliable data and they never had the means to inject information to, to push things one way or the other. But 
Song Jian was not was not deterred. He was promoted into the uh, into the leadership. He became basically in charge of science at that time, and his ideas spread throughout various think tanks that were operating under the leadership and out into the social sciences. There was what's called the San Luan Ru, this uh, a three theories fever in China at the time, which was, a, which was a popular interest in cybernetics. Everybody wanted to read about cybernetics. Everybody wanted to write about cybernetics. Um, some of the books here are on the far right. This is Population Cybernetics by Song Jian and Yu Jing Yuan, which was a very popular book at the time, not just in the think tanks, but as well in, in uh, you know, among people who read popular science uh, journals and, and whatnot, which was more than you might expect. And in the middle is Economic Cybernetics, uh, written by one of the promoters of reform at that time. Uh, they were very interested in the idea that cybernetics could provide management of a market economy, which in, in to some extent Song Jian had proved by using cybernetic methods in price controls. That was one of the things he worked in. And then on the left is the most interesting book, which is called uh, Cybernetics and Scientific Method by a gentleman called Jing Guan Tao. He applied cybernetic ideas and information theory ideas, systems theories ideas to social sciences and Chinese history. And basically he's responsible for launching a, a craze in the social sciences for, for cybernetic thinking. Now we gotta, I think I've got to skip ahead here a bit. So um, the interesting thing is to look at with Chinese cybernetics is the theories that underpin it. Now, up until this point, everything has been sort of coming from uh, either Soviet thinkers or American thinkers in, in cybernetics and information theory. But it's at this point, it's at a point in the, in the 1990s that China starts to break away and to start its own distinct theorizing on cybernetics. This makes getting into Chinese cybernetics extremely difficult because so much of the language is distinct and is drawn from this theorizing of the 1990s. So what Qian Sui Sen did at this time was embark on a new period of theorization. And he worked with those people from various, uh, those missile scientists who had gone on to sort of freelancing in, in the market economy. What he did was he proposed a complete reorganization of, of human thought um, that managed to, to integrate any number of things, whether it's the social sciences or the arts, um, physics and biology into one massive uh, system. So, I mean, we can see here, uh, he proposed that, that um, for example, social sciences, social science was, was linked to Marxist philosophy through uh, historical material system science to Marxist philosophy through systems research, cognitive science to Marxist through epistemology. Uh, Marxist philosophy, whatever he meant by it, is, is at the basis of that. And as well, very controversially, he included in, in his reorganization what he called somatic science, or uh, sometimes translated as human body science, which included um, telekinesis and very popular at the time, being able to read an envelope like, uh, like Johnny Carson by just tapping it to your forehead, that sort of thing. He was very interested in those, in those ideas. Um, and he wrote that into his reorganization of his of of science you know the interest in in somatic science and these what he called extraordinary functions is is basically what pushed him to theorize this idea of metasynthetic engineering from the qualitative to the quantitative uh let's see if we have anything about that where he basically reorganize the, the scientific method uh, to make it in simple terms, let's say 
you saw a man bending a spoon by touching it. A man rubbed the the handle of a spoon and its uh, its head dipped. Um, that that is based on a based on a subjective experience, which through metasynthetic engineering you integrate with quantitative data. The quantitative data will not necessarily support the qualitative observation, but you manage to um, sort of put them together. This is, this is, I mean, this is uh, very, very silly stuff at, at, a, at a certain level, but it, it builds out into his idea of metasynthetic engineering, which is in, incredibly important. Um, he conceived of an idea called the Hall for Workshop on Metasynthetic Engineering, um, which is sort of this system you see here, but in effect can combine human and individual and group intelligence. You feed in uh, qualitative observations and quantitative data and outcomes an assessment of, of the thing. This is an idea that I fear I'm not explaining very well because it's very hard to to explain because it's it's quite irrational. It doesn't make sense because you're taking it's it's an it's an idea that was used to support telekinesis, um, but it's an it's an idea that has incredible staying power in in Chinese thought and Chinese thinking about cybernetics and Chinese thinking about urban planning and AI until this day. Um, just going to speed through here a little bit. Uh, Chen Sui Sen he died in, in 2009. And what he left behind was, was basically the basis for what we see today. You cannot read any writing in Chinese on, on smart cities or cybernetic planning of the economy without knowing uh, these sort of floaty ephemeral ideas from Chen Shui Sen. He lived long enough to, to theorize on artificial intelligence and the internet and virtual reality, which was quite lucky because those ideas have all now um, caught up with technology, as it were. Uh, this final example I like to give for a cybernetic thought in China is, is the recent, recent pandemic controls where you have um, a central hub attempting to plan and monitor the, the movements of, of many people. Um, again, we have the problem of limited sensors and, and weak effectors. Last year, Shanghai went into a lockdown uh, for most of the summer because of basically human negligence in testing. Uh, so the, all of the surveillance efforts were uh, compromised by that human negligence. And, but when the system was reliable, um, it, still, it, still ran into, it still ran into difficulties because it wasn't fully integrated with, say, the delivery of food. So you would have a lockdown of a community with, uh, without food being delivered to it. It was sort of the same situation as the, the one child policy. Another earlier, we could say, failure of, of cybernetic management, uh, where the, the program was allowed to continue on and on past the point that it, that it stopped working. That's sort of a problem. Uh, I might come off as a skeptic about cybernetics, but in China, this is often um, more of a branding exercise than an actual cybernetic uh, management system, uh, I would say. Okay, it's very difficult to go through the, the history of cybernetics in China in, in, in just this short of time, and I, I hope I haven't been too incoherent or put together too many uh, silly ideas. Um, at the end, oh, there's one more slide. Uh, prospects for the future of cybernetics in China. It's interesting to think about, could they go beyond simply branding everything as systems engineering, branding it as, as, as cybernetics? It seems that's the direction they would like to move in with the return of central planning, um, 
decentralization of power. You can see that as an effort to control AI and algorithm and prompt pushing these ideas of big data governance, which I think should be called cybernetic governance. Um, and China is very much pinning its hopes on the ability of the state to manage this sort of program more effectively. But uh, so far, they, they seem unable to do so. I'll, I'll pause there. And uh, if anyone has any questions or anything to say, go ahead. Thank you, Dylan. John, I know you've got your your hand raised. <laughs> I have. So first of all, with my president's hat on for, for probably the last time, hopefully the last time anyway. Um, say thank you to Dylan. That was really, really interesting. Um, and, and yeah, very difficult, I'm sure, to, to consolidate all that work into, into sort of half an hour's perspective on it. Um, I'm reassured by it um, because um, the discoveries of, of Ashby and Wiener, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, of early robotics, um, demonstrated that the word latency has far more meaning than we typically give, give it credit to, um, because it indicated that, that the um, when we centralize decisions and, and delocalize them, um, we of course also denature them. And it's in effect for me, in my interpretation of, of, of organizational cybernetics, um, a kind of denial. Once we centralize things, the time between um, opportunity and, or, or need and decision uh, becomes so great that we lose control of it all. So the cybernetics inherently sort of fails. So philosophically, a, a cybernetic system needs local organization, needs self-organization, as opposed to self, as opposed to central control. So the great news is the Chinese experiment will ultimately fail. Um, it's only a question of, of when. But then, mm -hmm effectively all large-scale experiments in cybernetics have already failed so um you know, one, one way or another uh, dylan really really interesting that's not really a question more of a sort of rambling response but really found it really fascinating thank you you're very welcome very welcome omar i think, think you had your hand up next <laughs> yeah i tried to i found this fantastically interesting so thank you um um mr king or dr king um mr king mr king um i i remember reading a report 2018 by the rand corporation talking about how the chinese military wants to how it envisages war in the future and it's called system destruction warfare and confrontation obviously i don't want to go into it too much because i want to take everyone else's time but do you have at least a single author that you know in the military sphere in China that's that's currently involved in bringing cybernetic systems theory into the PLA's current doctrine of warfare? Anything on the top of your head? I will definitely email you after just to bug you for some more names, but right now, top of your head. Certainly, um, nothing off the top of my head, but I'm uh, I'm very absolutely atrocious at remembering names. Um, the that that military. Um, piece of it is very interesting because systems engineering basically as it was conceived by Tian in the in the 1970s early 1980s basically splintered into various um, disciplines of systems engineering so there was legal systems engineering which has sort of um, developed now into sort of AI courts and whatnot and uh, management of of surveillance systems and police systems. And then defense systems engineering or defense cybernetics was perhaps the most fruitful of, of all, those, uh, all those disciplines. And it, uh, a lot of it, I suspect, is still, is still classified. But um, basically, this was given impetus by, the, by watching the Gulf War happen and China seeing it's behind and China seeing that perhaps this sort of uh, these uh, cybernetic or systems engineering ideas from Tian Shui Sen could, could provide the, um, the edge in warfare. Um, yeah, feel free to email me. I, 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 I wish I had time in this presentation to include defense cybernetics, but it, it was a, a, a bit tight, but that's a very, very interesting area. Oh, thank you. We, I can't hear you, uh, Jonathan. Sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Peter, I think you had your hand up next. Um, yeah, thank you. So 
Uh, again, I thought that was brilliant, Dylan. I thought that was just just great. Thank you so much. And so many questions to follow. To follow, but I think um, more of a comment then. And again, following very much in the kind of um, line of thinking that John has just established in his response. But it seems to me that's a very powerful story here, which is that let's say from the 20th century into the 21st, we, we have this kind of growing necessity of negotiating technological relations, relations between what is human and what is technological. And we just have that growing problem with the development of the kind of society that, for example, Heidegger talks about, as you, as you mentioned in passing and so on. So we have this big problem and it seems that like, um, I'm, I'm very in influenced by a comment that uh, Zizek made here, but it seems that in the end, we, we end up with this two interpretations. One is, is um, to see an opportunity in centralization. And, and this is the China story. And then we have a sort of a, a kind of a, an opportunity, but a kind of confused set of insights into decentralization, which John is pointing at. And the decentralization argument is basically saying Ashby and, and other theories uh, show that there are contradictions in the in the centralized story. You you never have the data when you need it, you know, uh, at a at a centralized basis. You 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 think you can, but you never can. And and the the kind of Shanghai experience with COVID is is a is a good example of that. So that to me to, to bring my comment to to a kind of point is to say this is one of the really interesting things we need to work upon, which is really to to make the decentralized case around cybernetics. You know, this um, for an ecologically challenged world to see that localism grow and, and develop where the variety equations ultimately can work um, uh, and, and latency is not such a for, formidable um, uh, challenge. Um, so again, just to make that kind of final point, very influenced I was by an observation made by Zizek when he basically was uh, arguing uh, in a lecture that the, the world is really dividing into two camps and, it, and it's a kind of a centralized and a decentralized camp. And, um, and I think quite a lot of thinking that we can do over the next year or two is around that decentralized opportunity um, rather than the centralized opportunity. I hope that makes some sense. Absolutely. And, and the interesting thing about China is that, that after 1978, it was it was about decentralization. Uh, China rose because it it gave so much autonomy and power to the localities. It, it yes. said, you in Shenzhen can can do whatever the heck you want as long as it makes us money. Um, whereas, and it was extremely successful, extremely successful with, with, um, with even big data governance and, and AI and smart cities and whatnot, when they stayed on the level of local experiments. But China, since 2011, has has gone in the direction of centralization with this idea that that um, if we want big data governance, it cannot work on a small scale. It cannot work on a in a federalized system. It cannot work decentralized. We need to run everything through central hubs, and and that's been a big goal of of China with its various plans that it's made for AI or with cybernetic solutions for the courts is bringing everything so it runs through the center. And um, I, I think, as you said, and, and maybe as Zizek said, uh, that, that perhaps isn't the, has proven itself not the, not the best way to deal with this kind of thing. Yeah, wonderful, Dylan. I really hope we can talk much more. Sure. Great, thank you. Um, I can see five people with hands up. Um, I think we can probably afford to run to 20 past um, on the Q&A section. So, so we'll cover the five people with hands up. So Vanilla, I think you were the next in the queue with your hand up. <laughs> Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, good. Um, fabulous talk. Fascinating. I kept referring in my head to the methodology of all this for the Chinese people to communicate 
these concepts with one another, they have to invent the right calligraphy. At what point did the calligraphy for cybernetics get invented and who verified it? Mm. That's a very good question, because the interesting thing is, is that the word cyber, first of all, this is sort of a tangent, but the word cybernetics has a Chinese translation, which is Kongzhi Luan, which means Kongzhi means control, Luan means theory, control theory. Huh. Um, but that, that term is very rarely used nowadays in Chinese. Uh, it's used to refer specifically to, you know, first order cybernetics, uh, where this idea of of systems engineering has 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 gained ground. Everything is referred to as systems engineering. That means cybernetics, system cybernetics, whatever cybernetics you're talking about is called systems engineering. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really a case of of uh, of of inventing, let's say, a new a new character to write it, but but simply taking you know, loan words. So in this case, systems engineering is, is the, is the word for si tong, which means system and, um, gong chong for engineering. I mean that the, to talk about why, how Chinese has a word for system and has a word for engineering is very interesting too. That, that goes back to, uh, translating books from, from German and from, and from Dutch and from English in the, in the 19th century. So those words sort of, uh, Kind of hung around there. Japanese is very different, of course. You can just write, uh, basically, romanize it in its in its katakana uh, spelling, and everybody in Japan will talk about cybernetics, but in in China they'll talk about kongzhi luan. So it, that that is a great barrier to understanding it because they've in, in China they've invented all of this language to get her, to describe these things, because also at various points they were they were in isolation from or in opposition to both the United States and the Soviet Union. So they were they were trying to separate themselves from Soviet cybernetics at the same time as they were either isolated from or in opposition to what was going on in, in the United States. So it's sort of become this distinct tradition with its own distinct vocabulary, distinct theory that makes it very hard for anyone who's, you know, even if you do speak Chinese to to wrap your head around these these concepts. That's amazing because I mean, we all have enough trouble uh, defining the terms that we use and quarrel frequently about <laughs> about meaning. So, I mean, it's handy that I think control theory is a, is lovely. And sorry, I mean that works, doesn't it? That particular term. Yeah. But it would be nice to see how, for instance, um, oh, I don't know, give me any cybernetic term. How any of them, um, like are feedback. Like feedback, feedback like is very would. interesting. Sure, yes. yeah. so, uh, any any of these things are, are. Anyways, thank you. I mean, I'm sure this is as big as a dictionary, so let's not yes. go down that route. But uh, thank you, interesting indeed. You're very welcome, David. Think you had your hand up next. Sorry, who had the hand up next? You, David. <laughs> I right, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Dylan. Superb talk. And I'd recommend other people to search and read a variety of your other articles. Obviously, one's interested in parallels and what one can learn from different people's experiences. And I can, the, the narrative in the West and the use of systems and cybernetic uh, theory is one of the we could call it worldviews, ideologies, religions, economic theories, uh, to sort of save us from uh, questions of morality and interest. We've got Leibniz saying, let us calculate. and But then we've got uh, Hume saying, you can't get aught from is. And yet we seek these worldviews, which kind of, automatically uh, justify who does what, but tend to get captured by uh, the ongoing elites. Elite. So as I see it, the equivalent in the West is captured in a book by uh, Professor Mike Robinson, who was a Marxist whose PhD thesis was uh, funded for turning into a book by the American military in his critique of the use of systems theory uh, in Vietnam in that uh, book groups. And we've got this whole uh, issue of 
translating um, uh, our models of the world into some kind of actuality, which is ostensibly for everybody's benefit and implicitly for the group pushing the ideologies uh, benefit. How far is that also a reasonable characterization of some of the cybernetics uh, thinking in China, or is it just very much a two way thing? Well, I, I think if I'm if I think it's 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 been a, a very powerful idea, especially after the depoliticization of China. So you in with in 1978, you have this idea that we're sick of politics. We don't want politics. We are going to get our our guidance, our morality, our everything from the technicians, the technicians and this idea of planning and calculation is going to define define everything. Um, you know, this 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 discussion of cybernetics in China really requires a like a, a much deeper discussion about the philosophy of technology in China. You know, that that Heidegger quote about uh, when communism comes to China, technology will be free was turned out to be very prescient, uh, even after communism uh, has to some extent, you know, uh, disappeared. Uh, there is still in, in the absence of, a, of, of that radical politics or mass politics, technology has become a religion, has become the solution to everything. And there's not much of a pushback on it. Um, there is not, there is not much of an opposition to it. It's a very popular idea that it in a way that it's not in the West. Um, the, the, the Chinese are still techno utopians, whether their schemes have been successful or not. They are still believing that they are going to get ahead in this upcoming fourth industrial revolution, and they're going to deliver the utopia with with technology. Sorry, it helps. I, I believe their own propaganda. <laughs> Yeah, they do, and and a lot of it is with it. It, it is th that's the reason there was such a. Um, if you go back to the nineteen eighties, where you have that boom in popular interest in cybernetics and information theory, systems theory, um, at the same time, there's there's so much interest in Alvin Toffler and 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 uh, and uh, what was his book, The Third Wave. Yeah, future shock, future shock. Alvin Toffler was a celebrity in China at that time. And um, even if now a lot of more of the thinking on technology has sort of been indigenized, it still goes back to to that uh, that that moment in the in the late 1970s and late 1980s when it when it looked like technology could save the country from from itself. I think that's still the uh, belief. Thank you. I'm going to move to Boris. We've also got Angus and Martin with questions, so mindful of time. So, Boris, do you want to go next? Yes, uh, I must say, is anybody else that it was perfect? It was really brilliant, uh, Dylan. Uh, and uh, I would like to point to the winners, uh, winners' uh, understanding of cyber cybernetics. Uh, he wrote that. Uh, he wrote this introduction to the cybernetics and uh, more. We have to know about human body or human functioning is uh, knowing general physiology. I went very deep into understanding of uh, human uh, body and uh, genetics and so on. Uh, and I'm interested if uh, do you know anybody in China that went so deep into understanding of cybernetics because uh, I understood when I was reading uh, the book that uh, Wiener Sanha uh, divided uh, cybernetics into two parts, you know, one part was understanding uh, human organism how function or living beings how, how function, how, uh, and uh, the other part was how mechanisms which we see in human body and mind are transferred to machines. Yeah, I, I <clears throat> and uh, I in my last presentation. Yeah, 
I, I, in my last presentation, I went to uh, stimulating and uh, we're having troubles hearing you, Boris. I think you're breaking uh, so a bit. Understanding. I suggest we let Dylan answer Boris's question. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. I'll. No, sure. I'll, I'll mute Boris. Yes, go for it, Dylan. Sure. I, I think perhaps the um, the thinker we're looking for is is Tian Sui Sen himself, who who was bold enough to to include things like um, telepathy in his in his ex examination of the world. It, it looks very silly now, but he's the one who who proposed that the only way to understand these open giant complex systems was to take in all the subsystems. So looking at a society. It would need to be also include, you know, the human body itself, the, uh, you know, this this sort of um, theorized transfer of energy between individuals in the form of qi. Um, but I, I think if you go back into the writing of, of Tian himself in the 1990s, and um, uh, I think are called Dai Ru Wei, I think that it's it's all there. That sort of organology, uh, which he, he sort of calls, recalls um, the, the French thinker Simon Don. I, I think that's, the, if you go back to 1990s, Tian Sui Sen, Dai Ru Wei, you, you'll find that sort of crazy comprehensive vision of, uh, of systems, if that's a good answer. Got three people with hands raised up. I realize Steve maybe stuck in just after I try to <laughs> pull the shutters down. Um, D D Dylan, um, are you able to stay till the end of the meeting? So I was going to propose that we do have the break now and maybe return to the questions, remaining questions yeah. at the end of today's session. Martin, Steve, actually Angus, I know you have to leave at 12, so maybe we'll allow you to say, mm -hmm. uh, but Martin Randall, and Steve, are you Randall. okay with that? Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've got all the time. I was, I was thrown out. I wasn't present uh, to hear the answer from Dylan. Um, uh, we, we've recorded it, Boris. So maybe we're going to break in a second. Okay. okay. So we can okay, we can send you the recording. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. That's all right. So, sorry, Martin, Steve, Angus, are you are you guys okay to ask questions at the end? I think Angus, you've got to leave. So, did you want to ask your question now before we just head into the break? Well, I thought you wanted to stop at 11.20, so I was going to withdraw my question to enable us to break, so. Okay, great. very gracious of you. Thank you, Angus. <laughs> cool. Well, um, we'll break now. Um, back at back in five minutes' time, so that will be 11.20. So let's call it 11.30. Um, and then Dylan will return to the remaining questions for you right at the end of the session. Brilliant. Okay, well, see you all back uh, at 11.30.